The influence of latitude upon national tendencies in superstition is far too wide a subject to be here discussed in any detail, but speaking generally, it may be said that the superstitions of a people are largely a matter of climate. The person whose gods are based upon conceptions of the thunderstorm, the grim northern winter or the tropical sun, evokes sterner and more dreadful images than those whose lot is cast amid mild skies and gentle breezes. How wide is the difference between the grim gods who ruled the inhospitable heavens of Scandinavian and Teuton from the tolerant Bohemians who tenanted the classical Olympus? Nowhere is the influence of climate upon national temperament more clearly typified than in the island of Great Britain. Thor and Woden long held their own in the bare northern fastnesses, not to be finally driven out until they had tinged the Christianity which took their place with something of their own hopelessness and gloom. Just as the gods of Valhalla ever looked forward to the day of their destruction, so hell rather than heaven has always held the leading place in the Scottish imagination. So it came about that the superstitions of the Scot were gloomier than were those of his neighbour over the border. The conviction of her own sinfulness was always with her, and because there was a more imminent sense of sin, belief in witches and their malignancy was more intimate, and more resentful. The devil seemed so much more powerful to the dwellers of a bleak highland glen than to the stout yeoman walking amid his opulent English pastures. As in Rome and Greece, the witch was firmly settled in Scotland centuries before the coming of Christianity. But she was of another breed, as befitted her sterner ancestry. She and her demoniacal coadjutors held all the land under a grip of blood and iron. There was nothing amiable, nothing whimsical, nothing human about the spirits, of one kind or another, that lorded it among the mists and heather. Even the fairies had more in common with Loki than with Oberon, Elfame, their dwelling place, resembled rather hell than fairyland. In place of a loblie by the fire, who tormented no one but the idle or the wicked, you had a Kelpie, lurking in lonely places intent upon your murder, or a Banshee, prophesying your coming death or ruin. When at last Christianity came, it had a long, stern struggle against such antagonists. Nor, indeed, could it ever altogether overcome them, even though it forced them to adopt new names and new disguises. The missionary saints found their task of conversion increased tenfold by the strenuous opposition of the witches and other evil spirits. Saint Patrick, in particular, so enraged them and their master the devil, by his pertinacity that he was forced, for a time, to flee before their assaults back to Ireland. One of their most famous exploits was the bombardment with a mountain top of the vessel in which he was embarked. It is true that their aim was bad, and the mountain top fell into the sea instead of drowning the saint. But by this very mischance they provided permanent proof of their exploit, for the mountain top remains to this day to testify unto it, being that upon which Dumbarton Castle was subsequently built. Among the many legends dealing with these same early Scots witches, we are tempted to quote from one, taken down verbatim from the lips of an old Highland woman, by Norman MacLeod and related by him in his reminiscences of a Highland parish. In its modern form it was woven around the imaginary misadventures of a Spanish princess, and the real shipwreck of the Florida, one of the vessels forming the Spanish Armada, sunk near Tobermory, in Mull, in 1588. Actually, the magical passages have some much more ancient history, as we may judge from incidental reference to Druidism, from pre-Christian days. The first part of the legend relates how the Spanish princess came to Mull, there had a love affair with Maclean of Duart, who was murdered by his jealous wife. The King of Spain, hearing of his daughter's fate, fitted out a war vessel and dispatched it to Tobermory to take summary vengeance. Maclean and his people, feeling unequal to resisting it by ordinary means, sought aid from druidism and by powerful spells and charms gathered all the witches of Mull. He explained the position and begged them to raise a tempest and sink the Spanish vessel, pointing out at the same time that her commander, one Captain Forrest, was himself a magician. In due time the witches began their work of charm, incantation and chanting, but with little initial effect. 
stronger measures becoming necessary the chief which tied a straw rope to a quern stone, passed it over a rafter, and raised the stone as high as she was able. As it rose the wind rose with it, but she could not get it very high owing to the counterspells of the Spanish captain with the English name. Accordingly she called her sister witches to help her, witches with very much finer names, by the way, than their English colleagues could boast of. They were nine in all, and the names of five were Raggy, Frizzle Hair, the Finger of White John's Daughter, Hogganfoot from Glencoe and Great Blue Eye from Moy. All pulled together at the rope, but could not raise the quern stone. Some of them then flew through the air and climbed about the ship's rigging in the shape of cats, spitting and swearing. But Captain Forrest only laughed at them. At last the witches got a very strong man, to hold the rope and prevent the stone from slipping down again, while she flew off to Lochaba to beg the assistance of Great Garmel of Moy, the doyen of Scotch witchcraft, whose powers were more developed than those of all the others put together. Garmel accepted the flattering invitation, and set out for the scene of action. No sooner was she in the air than a tempest began, and by the time she reached Tobamori Captain Forrest realized that he had better retire. But before his cable could be cut Great Garmel had reached the ship, had climbed to the top of the mast in the shape of the largest black cat that ever was seen, and uttered one spell, whereupon the Spanish man-o-war with all her crew sank to the bottom of the sea. It is an indirect testimony to the high, if evil, place held by magic in Scotland that so many of its followers and practitioners were men and women of the first ranks of life. We have the dread figure of William, Lord Solis, boiled to death as the only fit punishment for the crimes committed in his feudal stronghold, such as put him on an evil parity with the Marshal de Retz, the French Bluebeard. Or again, in 1479, the Earl of Mar, with a whole band of male and female abettors of humbler rank, was burned in Edinburgh for attempts on the king's life by aid of waxen images and spells. Indeed, the whole family of this peccant nobleman proved, on investigation, to be tarred with the same magical brush. Lady Glamis, burned in 1536 as a witch, was one of the proud Douglases, widow of Lord Glamis, who she was accused of murdering. It is true that her death was very necessary to one of the contemporary political parties, though that may have been only a coincidence. In the following year occurred a witch trial of interest in itself, and the cause of the great outburst of persecution which for the next century makes the annals of Scottish justice run red with innocent blood. That of Dr. Fian. Fian was a schoolmaster at Lothian, he was further, according to his accusers, a wizard. His magic, however, gains its chief interest from its object, no less a person than James VI, later James I of England. This learned and Protestant monarch, being on his way to visit his Danish bride in her native land, the devil and his secretary laid a plot to drown him. They put to sea, after the vessel, along with a whole regiment of witches, and there cast an enchanted cat into the sea, raising a fierce storm, which could not, however, prevent the divinely protected James from reaching Denmark in safety. On his return journey the plotters tried to raise a fog whereby the royal ship might be driven ashore on the English coast. Towards this end Satan cast a football, or its misty semblance, into the sea, and succeeded in raising what may be accurately described as the devil's own fog. But angels guided the ship upon its proper course, and again the king escaped the assaults of his enemies. For these and other crimes Dr. Fian, with a number of women witches, was tried, tortured, forced to confess, and burned on Castle Hill, though he withdrew his confession before the end and died like a gentleman, and a scholar. It is an interesting point about the trial that in it occurs the first Scottish mention of the devil's mark. The effects of this outrage upon the Lord's anointed were not to end with the death of its presumed concoctors. If the tribe of witches had grown so bold, it was high time they were extirpated, and gallantly did the king and his advisers set about it. It was in 1563 that the persecution of the witch was regularized as a distinct branch of crime by an enactment of the estates, that no person take upon hand to use any manner of witchcrafts, 
sorcery, or necromancy, nor give themselves folk to have any craft or knowledge thereof there through abusing the people and that no person seek any help, response, or consultation, at any users or abusers of witchcrafts under pain of death. Thenceforward, until the last witch burning in 1727, the fires were seldom allowed to go out, and to be an old and ugly woman was perhaps the most dangerous trade in Scottish industry. Fear and the instinct of self-preservation, not cruelty, were the driving power in the witch murderer. Such is the similarity of the various Scottish witch trials that too detailed recapitulation would be tedious and unprofitable. Some, however, stand out from the rest by reason of their grotesque horror and exaggeration. Such is the trial of Isabel Grierson, spouse to John Ball, workman in Preston Pans, tried at Edinburgh in March, 1607. She was accused of having conceived a cruel hatred and malice against one Adam Clark, and with having for the space of a year used all devilish and unholy means to be revenged upon him. On a November night in 1606, between eleven and midnight, Adam and his wife being in bed, Isabel entered the house in the form of a black cat, accompanied by a number of other cats, and made a great and fearful noise, whereat Adam, his wife, and maidservant were so frightened as almost to go mad. Immediately afterwards the devil appeared, in the likeness of a black man, seized the servant's nightcap and cast it on the fire, and then dragged her up and down the house. Isabel was further accused of having compassed the death of William Burnett and of laying on him a fearful and uncouth sickness, by casting in at his door a gobbet of raw, enchanted flesh. Whereafter the devil nightly appeared in poor William's house in the guise of a naked infant child for the space of half a year. Occasionally he varied the performance by appearing in the shape of Isabel herself, but being called by her name would immediately vanish away. As a result of all which, Adam languished in sickness for the space of three years, unable to obtain a cure, and at last departed this life. Isabel, being found guilty of all these and other crimes, was ordered by her judges to be taken to the Castle Hill of Edinburgh, and there to be strangled at the stake until she be dead and her body to be burnt in ashes, as convict of the said crimes, and all her movable goods to be escheat and brought to our sovereign lord's use, as convict of the said crimes. The next twenty years are filled with a monotonous record of which trials, similar in essentials to those already quoted. Perhaps the most outstanding is that of Catherine Oswald, who kept many rendezvous with Satan, and cursed the yard of John Clark so effectually that for four years neither kale, hemp, nor other grain would grow therein. In 1633 twenty witches were executed. Sir George Home of Manderston being the most zealous persecutor, chiefly to spite his wife, with whom he was not on good terms, and who had a taste for black magic. Ten years later arose another fierce persecution, so that in Fifeshire alone thirty women were executed, the local ministry taking the lead in the prosecution. Two of the accused were domestic servants in service at Edinburgh. By their own confession they had been introduced to the devil by Janet Cranston, a notorious witch, and had by him been promised that, if they gave themselves bodies and souls to his allegiance, they should be as neatly clad as the best servants in Edinburgh. Janet Barker, one of the twain, admitted having the devil's mark between her shoulders, and when a pin was thrust therein it remained there for an hour before she noticed it. Needless to say, both were strangled at the stake and burned. Political ups and downs, whomever else they might affect, made no difference in the hard lot of the witch except that she was regarded as belonging to the opposite party by that in power. That did not, however, gain for her the sympathy of the defeated. Thus the death of Charles I according to many, could only have been compassed by the powers of darkness themselves. Cromwell was declared, by royalists anxious to explain away their defeats, to be Satan's direct agent, if not the devil incarnate, the commonwealth representing his kingdom upon earth. Thus although the republicans had done their utmost in the way of which harrying, their efforts were but feeble compared to those of the royalists upon the glorious restoration. Obviously a witch must be a friend to roundheads, and fearfully did she pay the penalty. 
somewhere about 120 were executed in the year 1661, immediately following the king's entering upon his own again. And now it was the turn of the victorious cavaliers to be regarded, by Presbyterian and Parliamentarian, as owing their success to the help of Satan and his agents. Their bishops were reported to be cloven-footed and shadowless, their military commanders to be bulletproof by enchantment, and to possess horses that could clamber among inaccessible rocks like foxes, the justices who put fugitives on trial for treason were seen in familiar converse with the fiend, and one of them was known to have offered up his firstborn son to Satan. The last Scottish execution of a witch took place in 1722. The prisoner was accused of having turned her daughter into a pony, shod by the devil and so ridden upon her, whence the girl was ever afterwards lame. Found guilty, this last of a long line of martyrs was burned at Dornoch, and scandalized the spectators, the weather being chilly, by composedly warming her hands at the fire that was to consume her.